website and our social uh, networks. And you can send us your questions at bigideas at IEA.org. Uh, with that, I will turn the floor to Dr. Fatih Birol, our executive director. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jet. Uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, thank you to all of you for joining us uh, today. Uh, I am delighted to welcome you once again to the IES Big Ideas uh, Speaker Series. Uh, as I think uh, many of you uh, know, uh, in this series, we invite the government leaders, business leaders, top thinkers, uh, heads of international organizations to hear their views about their work, about energy, climate, economy, uh, access to energy and these issues and have a, a good uh, discussion uh, and uh, hear uh, their uh, very perspective. Just two weeks ago, uh, I was uh, fortunate to host the Vice President of the European Commission, Mr. Franz Timmermans, who shared his uh, views and uh, vision on many important energy and climate uh, aspects, including on the uh, EU New Green Deal. Today, uh, I am very pleased to welcome uh, my dear friend, Mr. Francesco uh, La Camera, the Director General of International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, who has accepted to speak on the topic, the key role of renewables for a sustainable global recovery. Francesco, very many thanks for uh, accepting my invitation. It's a great, great uh, pleasure uh, for me. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, the topic is uh, at the heart uh, of our work, of uh, many governments' uh, uh, work. As uh, pandemic started this year, I uh, have said uh, clean energy should be at the heart of the global economic uh, recovery. And when we say clean energy, of course, one of the most, if not the most important policy option we have in hand is uh, renewables. And uh, the numbers we have at the IEA are, from a renewables perspective, very promising in the rather dark days of uh, global energy scene. Just to give you one example, we see, we expect, and we look at the entire energy sector, global energy use this year will decline about 5% decline, just to put in a context, uh, compared to previous crises, such as the 2008-2009 financial crisis, this year's global energy use decline is seven times higher than the, what happened after the financial crisis, a huge decline. We have seen decline in all the uh, fuels, but not in the renewable energy. Renewable energy was much more resilient. Solar, wind, they show a resilience here, especially in the electricity uh, uh, sector. Now, uh, it is the reason uh, we thought it is a good opportunity to hear the perspectives of a uh, leader uh, namely my uh, friend uh, Francesco La Camera, what he thinks about the renewable energy, what kind of role uh, it can uh, play in the next years, especially in the context of sustainable uh, recovery. So many of us know about uh, Mr. Uh, La Camera, but just to say a few things, uh, he took office is the uh, Director General of IRENA in uh, April uh, 2019, and he has a huge experience uh, in the field. Uh, previously, Mr. La Camera served as Director General of Sustainable Development, Environmental Damage it, at the Italian Minister of Environment, Land and uh, Sea. Uh, lots of experience, and he did a lot of works, a number of roles in the Italian Minister of uh, Environment, uh, Land and Sea. He has many publications uh, and he was also a lecturer of 
sustainable development at the University of Cosenza and, uh, and also at the University of Roma uh, Tri. Mr. La Camara uh, is also the graduate of the University of Messina in political uh, uh, sciences. So uh, just before going to hear uh, uh, Mr. La Camara's views opening uh, uh, statement, I wanted to tell you that the, I know Mr. La Camara since uh, many years. And when I heard that he was elected as the uh, director uh, general of uh, IRENA, I was the first one, maybe one of the first, I think I am the first one who gave him a call to congratulate him because I know he is the man uh, uh, for the job and the, uh, what we have seen in the last one and a half uh, years is that he proved to be a strong uh, leader the leading the Irena from success to success. So I was uh, very happy with it. And as it happens, his first uh, visit outside of uh, uh, the Abu Dhabi, where Irena is uh, uh, headquartered, was uh, to Paris to visit me, where we talk with a nice uh, chat, nice lunch, if I may say so, and discuss how we can further the relationship with. Uh, between our two institutions. And I can tell you that after he became the director general, uh, we stepped up our cooperation, our efforts, uh, getting a lot of uh, advice, suggestions from Irena colleagues from using the renewable cost uh, data to many other uh, things. So I would like to uh, stop uh, uh, here and I would like to give the floor uh, to uh, the handover to Director General of IRENA, Mr. Francesco La Camera, to hear his views. Francesco, once again, very nice to see you. I wish I could host you in Paris, in our uh, headquarters and uh, beyond, but uh, maybe in a couple of uh, months of time, I will enjoy uh, your uh, presence here and uh, your uh, friendship. Over to you, Francesco. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Fatih. It's a real pleasure to be your guest at the IA's Big Idea Series. In fact, we have uh, met already before my election and you project me as the new DG of ARENA. So it was really nice to receive your phone call that uh, was confirming that you were right. IA is a close partner of ARENA and I wish to recognize at the outset the excellent work of the IA team under your leadership and the increasing collaboration between the two agencies. Allow me also to congratulate David Turk that has been recently in, in named as uh, your deputy director. Congratulations to, to him. We have several common projects, the SDGs, seven tracking report, the renewable energy policies in a time of transition, heating and cooling, the IA Arena policy database, hopefully many more to come. And uh, as always, it, it is a pleasure to talk to you, Fatih. Unfortunately, this time only in virtual mode. This uh, last year has been unpredictable, tragic and disorienting. It is a time like this was we look for elements that provide stability and an avenue for the way out. Renewables have proven to be such an avenue. The energy system, along with the rest of the economy, has been shaken to the core. But renewables shows, as you say, a remarkable resilience. I say already in March that the renewable sector will fare better than the rest of the energy sector. And that has proven to be true. Renewables power was a preferred option, option for several reasons, most notably the easy and low operating costs. The COVID crisis was also an interest test case for the electricity systems. They have operated smoothly and reliably with high share of wind and solar debunking some of the myths around this issue. 
combine this fact make the business case for renewables even stronger. Arena estimates that by 2021, up to 1,200 gigawatts of existing coal fire capacity will cost more to operate than new utility scale solar PV would cost to install. With trillions of public money be injected in the global economy, this is once in generation opportunity to move towards renewable based energy transition. Today, renewables account for 35% of global capacity and over 25% of global power generation. ARENA estimates that this share must grow to close to 90% by 2050 for the 1.5 degree pathway. We need to reverse today's contribution of non-renewable and renewable supply in the global energy system. And we have to do rapidly. The IPPC 1.4 report set very clear targets. CO2 emissions should decrease by 45% in 2030 compared to 2010 and be almost zero in 2050. This means that oil and coal should have already picked and gas should pick in 2025. This requires extraordinary efforts. The recent announcement by China, Japan, South Korea, EU and its member, as recently Denmark and others, and UK are encouraging steps, but the bar is very high. But let me be very clear, we need to make a massive shift in the end use to decarbonize the energy sector. ARENA release is reaching zero report a few weeks ago, analyzing how we can decarbonize and use sectors. Many solutions already exist and need to be scaled up. For instance, electrification of the transport sectors. Other are in the making, notably green hydrogen, which cannot only add further flexibility to grids, but also help decarbonize several industries difficult to electrify, as well as a long range shipping through the use of ammonia and methanol fuel produced from green hydrogen. Now, I can the stimulus and recovery measures accelerate energy transition across all sectors. The key point is that any short term action need to be aligned with the medium and long-term strategy. In our post-COVID analysis, we took IRENA's 2050 scenario and consider what key actions should be taken in the coming three years and to 2030. We concluded that investment should flow towards renewables, efficiency, flexible interconnecting infrastructure and innovation. The report also lists actionable policies to guide this process. Government are balancing multiple crises now. ARENA has 162 members and 21 states in accession. So we see what policy measures must deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with different perspectives in different parts of the world. It is our job to make sure that we can be achieved with investment and decarbonization, what we can be achieved with investment and decarbonization of the energy system is clearly understood. It is about access to health services, water and clean air. It is about value chain and local capabilities. It is about job creation and increased welfare. Let me reflect on job creation, which as you know, Irene has been analyzing for almost a decade. The review this year showed that there were 11.5 million jobs worldwide in 2019, more than double since we started this stream of work. Let me also put this into perspective. There are 58 million energy jobs worldwide, which means that one fifth is renewable with solar and wind defested growing jobs. Our post COVID-19 agenda set the pace 
to have 5.5 million additional jobs in the next three years and 90 million jobs in 2030. ARENA estimates that every million invested in renewables would bring 25 jobs. And this is a compelling proposition for both developed and developing country. Our message is clear. Align short-term priorities with medium and long-term priorities is the way forward. Not only for environmental or climate, climate reasons, but also economic reasons. Investment must not lock in countries in economic world, not renewable energy structure, structure and create additional stranded asset in the future. Because this will adversely impact financial stability and dramatically reduce the needed, the needed fiscal, fiscal space. Let me emphasize that investment in renewable-based energy transition is also the avenue for a just transition which is essential in developed as well developed country and small islands. To realize this, we can no longer speak about energy in a silo, but have an holistic policy approach that promotes the resilience of economies and inclusiveness across society. Renewables must be the bulk of the energy system of the future, complemented by electrification, green hydrogen use, and modern bioenergy. ARENA is ready to show the way and collaborate with you and all to get there. Thank you very much and back to you, Fadi. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco, for this uh, perspective. Now, a couple of things I would be happy to uh, uh, discuss with you and uh, to the colleagues who are following uh, this uh, 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 Big Ideas uh, meeting. If you wish, please uh, send questions uh, to the email address that uh, my colleagues mentioned. And we have about 45 minutes, and we will be very happy to get your questions. And I'll be happy to direct them uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, La Camera. Now, Francesco, wind and solar, we both uh, agree that they are going strongly. And uh, I think that everybody, almost everybody agrees that they should even grow stronger than uh, uh, today. But when we look at the numbers, we, at the IEA, we believe in numbers uh, more than anything else. About 50% of the renewables coming from bioenergy. So uh, what policies uh, need to be deployed uh, by the governments uh, and the other stakeholders in order to foster the growth of uh, bioenergy? What would you say? So first of all, uh, I think that uh, uh, what is important is the, the, the approach. Because we have a strong contribution by, by, by bioenergy, but also by hydropower. And what I mean when I talk is important, is important is the approach. Because we need to look at the energy system from an holistic point of view. So the energy transition is not just a replacement of fossil fuel with renewables. It is a change in the mindset, moving from centralized to a decentralized system where coherent energy markets and modernized grids ensure flexibility and the interconnectivity along allowing all renewable sources to play their part in the system. And in this context, we can give complete value to the contribution of, of bio or bioenergy. And this is also when we, 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 we think about uh, what we say just the beginning of my introduction, introduction that uh, we have to uh, move to a massive shift in the and the use to decarbonize the energy sector. And uh, a lot could be done yet done by electrification more than we thought. In the report that I mentioned, we indicate many, many possible uh, avenue. That uh, bioenergy, modern bioenergy, together with a storage solution, digitalization, artificial intelligence, green hydrogen, could be really a way 
for supporting to be the way that may bring us in line with the path we have to go through uh, if we want to get the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement goals be achieved. Thank you, uh, Francesco. Another question I have in mind is that many governments around the world uh, support uh, renewables through different uh, measures. And in some cases, for example, subsidies. Uh, do you think that the world is, or the global energy sector is ready for a subsidy free renewables world? Uh, if the subsidies were all uh, cut, you think it is uh, the, the growth uh, will be still uh, there as uh, we would like to see? So naturally, my first reaction is uh, all the subsidies have to be cut. So uh, if we can make the, the, the question differently, we can say that the real question should be why is it the fossil fuel still receive direct and other subsidies? In 2017, the cost of unpriced externalities and the direct subsidies for fossil fuel exceeded subsidies for renewable energy by a factor of 19. Imagine how competitive renewables will be if we level it the playing field. So naturally, we have seen as, as uh, uh, the, uh, the different path in installing capacity uh, of renewables and conventional uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, capacity has been, go has been going the last years. And we have seen that the installing capacity by renewable has been increasing, increasing. Last year, I think it was 72%. And the gap with the traditional fossil fuel plant has been enlarging year by year. So naturally, uh, renewables now, they, they, they play in the fossil fuel range of cost. And for wind and, uh, and solar, they are more convenient in large parts of the planet. Naturally, electrolyzer, if you want to also to look to the future, storage, arti storage artificial intelligence, renewed grids and infrastructure should be promoted and supported in the cost of the post-COVID response. In this sense, I think that uh, the uh, response to the COVID could accelerate a path that is already there. So the question is uh, very simple. Renewables are unstoppable. The question is how far how rapid we can go to go along this way. So in this context, the support for the sectors I mentioned could be useful to go faster and in line with the 1.5 degrees. Uh, you are completely right. I think we all agree that the subsidies to uh, fossil fuel consumption need to be cut, erased. The, the, the problem is the following because we work on this almost uh, two decades, where the fossil fuel subsidies are put and the, which countries and where the renewable subsidies are in two different places, uh, basically. So uh, what I am afraid is the following. Uh, of course, fossil fuel subsidies should be cut, but I believe in certain cases, we still need continuous support of governments for the uh, renewables, at least at this stage, and uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, Francesco, especially in the context of uh, sustainable uh, recovery. Now, we have a question from uh, a press uh, asking you, what are your thoughts on the role wind can play specifically in the global uh, recovery? So we have dedicated uh, uh, our report on, uh, on the post-COVID agenda just to this. And uh, uh, we have already say about the sectors that are very important to be promoted during the, with the response to the COVID-19. 
And uh, we estimate that we need in the three years, or what we can say the short-term response, going for two trillions US dollar of investment early, early to get to where we have to be. This naturally is a very high bar. It means more than double the existing investment in the last couple of years. And we have to move to 4.9 trillion of investment per year up to 2030 for being in line with the, with the path to the 1.5. So, and uh, we have to privilege, as we say, the energy efficiency, renewables, and uh, uh, naturally also what I just mentioned, uh, electrolyzer, storage, flexibility of the system. So in my point of view is that if we do the right choice, the government spending may leverage up to four times of private investment. And this possibly may bring up to the numbers that we need to up to be in line with the, with the Paris Agreement path. Thank you very much. Let me go to another subject international oil companies. So oh, we have been hearing from the international oil companies that they are uh, making and they've been making a lot of investments in clean energy and uh, renewables. Uh, what we do is, uh, Francesca, every year, again, we look at the numbers rather than statements. What we have found out in our last investment report, we look at what they say and what is happening and what we found out last January that only 1% of the total investments of the IOCs, international oil companies, go to uh, clean energy, including the uh, renewables. But after that, we have seen many IOCs are uh, very keen to put money in renewables. It can be solar, it can be wind, it can be bioenergy. Do you, what kind of contribution should we expect from IOCs in the renewable uh, domain? Oh, I think that uh, we expect a strong contribution by, by, by them. I think that uh, oil gas company may compete as they can collaborate with the renewables uh, utilities and company. So, as you say, also us, we have seen uh, uh, this growing uh, interest thanks to the competitiveness of renewable energy and also the pandemic has made clear how global challenges has to be challenged. So we need to do, and uh, we need to do fast in, find, in fighting climate change. So um, we have seen the British giantess BP announced its plan to reduce its oil and gas production by 40% by 2030, increases renewable capacity by 95% to reach 50 gigawatts. And B BP is not alone, there are Shell, Total, ENI that are going this direction. And they also show interest in investing in batteries and the electric vehicles infrastructure in their business. So we, uh, we see space for all. We see space for competition. We see space for collaboration. For example, for instance, we have seen Equinor and Mazda, two different worlds, joining for important offshore investment in the North Sea. So I think the space is there also for the oil and gas company. And what is clear, uh, I think, is that moving too late means losing opportunities and competitiveness. Thank you, Francesco. I, I really hope that the, uh, the, this IOCs, their move uh, will be in the right direction and at the right pace. So we will see when we make the update of our investment report, what happened is 1%. Uh, the share of uh, clean energy, what it goes to, and I hope at least to double digits, uh, I hope to see. 
A question from a student, uh, not always the press we go, but the students as well. Uh, what should be the strategy of the European countries in renewable energy objectives, such as achieving sustainable development in the European countries? So uh, to respond, uh, I could say that uh, the EU and the new Green Deal has put uh, the European Union in a clear position of leadership in going to uh, in, the view, in the path to the COP26 and then uh, the efforts of being in line with the, with the Paris Agreement. I think going to 50, 55% of CO2 reduction is really something that uh, raised the bar very high. And uh, I think that uh, they are uh, doing well because there is uh, this uh, general framework where they are putting the hydrogen strategy, the offshore wind uh, and the ocean energy strategy. So we are putting all the pieces of the puzzle all together. And what is important to notice that uh, in the new European Green Deal, there is also a clear message in uh, the direction of cooperation because the EU is really accepting and promoting the principle that we have to come out from the crisis the both crisis, pandemic and climate change, if we work together. And it's also important that is, uh, they are a priority in the just transition. So we know that we are, we are going to lose uh, jobs in the traditional fossil fuel sector. So it's important that the reskilling of this worker can allow for a rapid move to the new sectors. And this just transition focus it is important uh, to see. So hopefully the European Union uh, is leading the way. I think other countries as South Korea, Japan as joining in this approach is also encouraging the commitment from uh, China. So I think that's uh, uh, having the, a look to the, what the European Union is trying to do will give ops. This is, this marries very well with the next question we have received uh, from an energy analyst. Uh, what, uh, you, as you mentioned, several countries make pledges uh, to uh, 2050 net zero. Uh, what kind of challenges uh, they have to overcome in terms of renewables uh, to reach their pledges? So we, we, we say in our introduction that we have just to reverse the contribution of the traditional renewable sector to renewables in, uh, in 2050. So we have to go for renewables to be, uh, all the electricity come more or less from, uh, from renewables and we can have uh, all the energy, total fine energy consumption be around the 65, 70% from renewables. For doing that, what is important in my point of view is the clarity. So if there are not uncertainty, and we still see that in the package, the government are preparing it, there is still someone that is, uh, sometimes seems to, to look at the past and then won't look very clearly to the future. So if governments go as the European Union, as others, setting the way on where to, uh, they have to go, I think we may make use not only of the public resources, but we have all the investment going that direction. So what is important is to have clear target, coherent policies, and this uh, uh, guidance will, uh, will help and support the efforts of a country in every part of the world to get to what they need to, to, to get. Thank you, Francesco. Another question I have is about uh, hydropower. I mean, solar is growing very strongly. I don't know if you heard, uh, I crowned uh, solar as the king of uh, power markets, uh, uh, global power markets to come. Wind is growing very strongly, but we have also hydropower, which is a big chunk of the total renewable electricity uh, generation. They 
in the renewable discussions, in fact, I should say in the energy discussions, the hydropower's voice is not very much heard. Uh, what do you think, what are the obstacles to develop hydropower uh, further in the uh, global uh, electricity generation? Firstly, I think that hydropower is to play an important role in the energy future system. I think countries that have high quantity of hydropower energy are the country that are going faster to 100% renewables. Hydropower ensure not only energy, but they are essential, very important in ensuring the flexibility and the stability of the system. The main question that we have is now that we also need to renew the hydropower facilities around the world. And naturally, IRENA attributes to hydropower a very important meaning. This is the reason for us to have established a collaborative framework on hydropower, where we are joined force with all countries that are concerned and interested by, by these thematics. We have been able to join with the Hydropower Association. We are in the way to sign memorandum of, uh, of understanding with them to make clear how is important in the mix of uh, the renewable energy, the role of uh, hydropower. In the following up of the collaborative framework, we also will, will open to other organizations and naturally to the EIA as to the private companies. And I offer this, uh, this uh, collaborative framework may host a debate that make clear how hydropower is important. It is important that we renew and increase the capacity that is around the world. Definitely, I agree with you. Uh, hydropower's voice is not heard strong enough and uh, we are very keen to uh, make it heard very loudly as the hydropower uh, deserves. Another question from the press. Renewables are kind of, in quote, interruptible source of energy. What could be the best mix with hydrocarbons and renewables decades by decades over the path towards the best achievable grade of decarbonization? So naturally, the future is without hydrocarbon. Uh, naturally, in, uh, uh, in this period, we may uh, have a limit also in the capacity to go in the direction, uh, for example, for a large use of, uh, of uh, uh, hydrogen. So it could be important to imagine in this pathway that could be still a role for uh, fossil fuel generation of, uh, of energy. Particularly, I refer to the uh, gas that may be used to produce uh, uh, blue hydrogen that in a, a transition period could play a very important role. I think also Tinman uh, two weeks ago has made this point that uh, gas can play in a transition and definitely period a very important uh, role to build the market for hydrogen to allow the capacity of the electrolyzed to increase at the path needed to be ready in a decade or so for going more and more rapidly to, to green hydrogen. So the way for collaborating exists. Uh, naturally, we have to also to understand that we have to rapidly cut CO2 emissions if you want to have a, a good chance to stay in line with the 1.5 pathway. Thank you very much, Francesco. We have four minutes to go. Uh, maybe a last question before we uh, wrap up uh, to you. Uh, stimulus packages, recovery packages around the world. And we, when we made this study with IMF, we said that uh, in order to see that the emissions which are declining this year, not to rebound again, governments need to put clean energy at the heart of those recoveries. But today, uh, we did it uh, uh, 
perhaps four months, four and a half months ago, this, this uh, statement. But today, when we look at the recovery packages coming around the world from different countries, what do you see? If, uh, are you happy how they are uh, being developed? Are they giving enough emphasis? Emphasis it deserves uh, to uh, renewable energies uh, around the uh, world, the current recovery packages? Honestly, not. Uh, we see that there are still uh, a lot of dollars, 10 trillions that are going uh, not in the right direction. But this was honestly an assessment before the call coming from China, Japan, South Korea. I think also very important that companies that it's very well express it, that they are not ready to put their money in fossil fuel plant in Southeast Asia. I mean, the companies from Japan, from South Korea. I think the call of uh, Japan government has been really, really something. So we expect that this, uh, uh, together with other things happening around the world, that make this make possible to uh, change uh, uh, the path where it's not in, uh, in coherence with what we need. Uh, so we are concerned, but we are quite optimistic that we are building a strong path to the COP26 and uh, raising the hopes that we can get the 1.5 that, uh, that we wish to have uh, by the end of the century. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Very hopeful, very optimistic uh, views uh, uh, from you. I thank you very much for your uh, statement, for your candid answers to all the questions uh, from uh, our viewers and uh, from uh, myself. And we are very much looking forward to work with you, with your colleagues in this collaborative uh, uh, manner. At the IEA, of course, renewables is one of the cornerstones of our work at the IEA, but we look at all clean energy technologies. It is renewables, energy efficiency, number one fuel. I am sorry, uh, Francesco, renewables come number two, but energy efficiency number one, renewables, but other clean energy technologies, uh, hydrogen, carbon capture, utilization, and storage, and in the countries where it's accepted, uh, 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 nuclear power, electric cars. I, you mentioned electric cars. I am very happy to hear you mention electric cars, uh, but I am, again, uh, I want to be optimistic, but when I look at the numbers, uh, Francesco, this year of all the car sales, 2.5% uh, were electric cars, 42% was SUVs. Just going perhaps not in the right direction, but I hope it will, uh, uh, improve. So, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear viewers, uh, uh, we are very happy to host uh, the uh, Director General of uh, IRENA, uh, Mr. Francesco La Camera. Uh, we are going to continue with this big idea series with other uh, colleagues. Tomorrow, we are coming up with our annual uh, renewable uh, market uh, report at, at 10 o'clock. You will see we have uh, crowned uh, solar as the new king of the global power markets. We have some good numbers also coming from offshore wind. You will uh, see that. But uh, we need all clean energy technologies to reach our energy and climate goals, as Mr. La Camera mentioned. Francesco, all the best to you and to your colleagues uh, from me and from my colleagues at Taie. Please keep up the good work. Uh, we are with you. And I hope to host you very soon in uh, Paris. All the best to you from Paris to Abu Dhabi. Thank you. Ciao a tutti. Ciao a tutti. Bye bye. Thank you.